let's kick this off. I want to welcome all of you, and so many of you came, to Five Minute Linguist, where the Linguistics Society of America meets the world. Welcome. <laughs> So this is what it's going to be about. We have eight interesting talks. It might not surprise you to know that the idea is that they are to have the duration of five minutes. <laughs> and the idea is, of course, that as linguists, we all know how difficult it is to communicate to the general public, i.e., to really just about anybody we know, why we do what we do. We are not translators, we are not grammar pusses, but that's all that the layman has any reason to know that we do. So how do you explain to people, how do you explain to the media, to the world, what we do in a way that will keep them awake? One <laughs> aspect of maintaining the wakefulness is that you've got to keep it short, especially in today's world. You can't go on and on. So. That's what Five Minute Linguist is about. So we're sharpening our wits, and your job is to be one of the judges. That's some interesting polarity there. You are all <laughs> one of the judges. Now, the way you're going to vote is through those things in your pockets and your hands. And so I want you to watch all eight of these people, save up your judgments, and then register one at the end. Now, the other ones of our judges, we have a very exciting panel, are all sitting right there at the table. <laughs> Ben's already on his phone. We have Gretchen McCullough, W.A. Brenner, Michael Erard, and Ben Zimmer. Thank you all for being here. Now, we're going to start, because we only have this room for an hour. Our first speaker is going to teach us about something that is actually difficult to get across to the public, but it can happen. I once knew a guy who had pet chinchillas. He kept them in a round cage. They circled one another all the time. Here's what the analogy is. They were like vowels in the mouth. I thought of that <laughs> whenever I visited him. It's interesting to teach the public about how vowels are always moving, especially when it's in the South, and especially when it's Kirk Hazen, and especially when right now he's going to tell us about southern vowels and shifting Appalachian identities. Please bring it, Kirk. Southern vowels and shifting identities. Because people use vowels to create identities, we are able to track how people have work themselves out in America, and some of the rural and urban divides we have seen in the last presidential debate. There's all kinds of pointers to these kinds of divides. We know that dialects form identities, but what we also find is that there are TV viewerships, Duck Dynasty versus, let's say, Modern Family, that show all kinds of divides in rural and urban areas in the US. We can also know that vowels can show regional identities also. Here we have the South divided out from the rest of the nation by vowels. Now, if we're going to talk about vowels in space, we need to talk about them not on the page. Most people think of vowels as blocks on a page, frozen there. But we need to talk about vowels in space. <laughs> Formed by the mouth, floating free in the air. <clears throat> Thankfully, vowels are like musical notes, and they fall along a scale. And this scale has measured qualities. And with this measured scale, linguists are able to make a map of the mouth. And here we have vowels. High, low, front, back. Here we have <clears throat> E and I, A and E, A and U. Uh. This map of the mouth plays out differently in different regions of the country. We're going to talk about West Virginia and some of the changes to what this rural area was in the 20th century. Because what we would expect is different from what we find. When vowels move around, it's like a game of musical chairs. Sometimes a vowel gets kicked out. Sometimes everyone's a winner. In the South, this game of musical chairs plays out like this. 
with E and E trading places and A and E trading places also. What we would expect is that in West Virginia, being a rural area, the entire state would have this specific southern vowel shift. It isn't quite what we find. When we divide West Virginia in half, we see that the northern area doesn't have much of this shift. A and E are a bit close to each other. In the south, E and A are actually on top of each other, and E and E are close, but it's not a full reversal. What we see is that in these groups, there's all kinds of variation, and it progresses differently throughout the 20th century. So with this diversity in West Virginia vowels, we can see the effects of all kinds of things, especially population contact and changing norms. You might think that early social radio, early social media like radio would have a big effect. Voices coming in from outside to people's homes. But we don't see that change. In the northern half of West Virginia, we see actual southern patterns early on in the 1920s. We can see an A reversed in vowel space. In the southern area, we get a complete, full musical chair games of the southern vowel pattern, with it an E reversed and a, an A reversed. This is the completion of the southern vowel shift. But in the 1940s and 1950s, what we have is a big influx of people bringing external norms in to mostly town areas in West Virginia. And we start to see changes in different parts of West Virginia because of this face-to-face -face contact, which is different from one-way communication of radio or TV. So in the 1950s, we have northern town folk dropping the southern vowel shift completely. By the 1970s, we see southerners in towns dropping it but not in rural areas. They actually keep the southern vowel shift. So it's not that we have country vowels and town vowels. <laughs> it's that we have certain arrangements of town patterns and country patterns. Because of this diverse arrangement of vowels, linguists are able to track rural and urban divides in America to show our unity and our divisions across our great nation. I'd like to thank my illustrator and all the research assistants of the West Virginia Dialect Project. Thank you. Kirk, thank you very much. So you've learned about how those vowels move around. That friend of mine had some problems in his personal life because of those chinchillas, because people would, I'm stalling here while they change the laptop, people would come over to his house and he would have those little animals kind of scooting around. And I'm happy to say that I reconnected with him recently and he is married to a thoroughly charming and legitimate person. And so you too can have chinchillas in your house. Anyway, um, a question that you might have always asked, or at least I have in my own work, is what happens if a child is brought up with a non-uniform code of input? What happens if they're two languages, or just as interesting, often more? What happens if they're two dialects? You can imagine that children are going to speak faster. Frankly, that's not very interesting. <laughs> However, suppose children were to make certain conflicting patterns more <laughs> uniform. What do children do when mom speaks one thing and dad speaks another? That's being studied by a lot of people. One of them is Carmel O'Shaughnessy, and this is the part where she does it now. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, the judge is doing it. A lot of parents, you might hear the say that their all. teenage children yeah. speak a different language from them, or so it seems. I'm going to tell you about a situation yeah. where children really I did create a different language <laughs> from their parents. It's a small community in northern Australia, a Walpri speaking community, and the people there speak multiple languages and they switch between them. When I first went there in 1998, I heard this switching between languages a lot and I thought that was pretty interesting. But then after a while I realised that there was actually something much more interesting going on. And that is that people over about the age of 40 speak Walpuri most of the time, but they also switch very frequently into English and Creole, a local Creole, often within a single sentence. And we call this code switching. 
In contrast, people younger than that age speak a new language that we call light Walpuri, which combines all of those languages that the older speakers were switching between, and they also speak Walpuri and English and Creole. The way that they're combined uh, is like this. This is what it sounds like. We'll just listen to Diana here. <laughs> So what you can see here is that a lot of this new language is Walbury, just the same. <coughs> but also a lot of it is from English and Creole, and I've spelled it in the Creole time spelling. But believe it or not, I'm going to focus on this tiny little element, which is a single sound mm, because this is what is entirely new in this language. What has happened is that in addition to conventionalizing the switching and making a new system, these speakers added new things into the new system. They took the <coughs> mm from I'm and from him and from them and they gave it a new meaning and they stuck it on other pronouns like we and you. And so then we have a whole system that's entirely new. We can see where it comes from, but it's no longer the same. So from English we came and Creole we been come, where been means past tense. In light Walpuri we get whim come. Now, it doesn't seem like such a big change, but actually in linguistic terms, this is a really dramatic innovation. <laughs> um, it's something like if in English we took the us from was and we stuck it on all of our pronouns and we made a completely new system, that would be different. We don't do that. Okay? But that's how different these innovations are in the new system. But right now I want you to look at another change in this new system where the speakers took wanna from I wanna and changed it into anna. I'm gonna get a baby with red cup and go. So that's fairly straightforward. <laughs> now we're gonna, we're gonna move over to an English monolingual speaker um, who also changes from wanna to anna. Exactly the same kind of thing. So you have cool great man to hold it. I'm gonna hold it up. Well why would we leave it there? It's easier. So this is really intriguing because at first it seemed like all of that innovation and reanalysis was going on because of the multilingual complex situation in that small community in Australia. But now we see, oh, the same thing is happening in English monolingualism. But of course, this hasn't spread through the English language. And I know that children say this and everyone else doesn't even notice. They just think it's wanna. So part of our question was, uh, when we see these kinds of uh, rapid changes taking place in small communities like the one that I'm studying, does that mean that children are actually processing what they hear differently from, for example, English monolinguals? Or is it the same kind of processing but something social is going on differently? Because we have a situation where we have the same kind of change taking place, but in English it doesn't spread, and in light Walpuri it does. Now we're going to move back to before the changes took place in Light Walpuri. Here we have a man who is older than that group, so he is code switching between languages, and he's speaking to very young children and a baby uh, in a special kind of a way, just like in English we might speak to babies using baby talk. And what you'll notice here is that he doesn't use bin. So dem findum is clearly not the kind of English that uh, most of you and I speak, but he's not using bin. So what has happened is that these light Walpuri speaking children, the ones who created the new system, they took input like that and they made a very small change from their point of view as learners, very similar to the change from wana to anna. Uh, and then it spread throughout the entire language. So in one uh, situation, we've got the child reanalyzing what they hear, and it doesn't spread through the language. And in the other situation, there's a reanalysis, and it does spread through the language. The processing is exactly the same, so the differences must be social. There's something about being in a small, remote, multilingual community, far from pressures of linguistic conformity, that allows that kind of real analysis to spread through a whole language. Thank you very much.
And as interesting as that is, about two years ago, if you changed the name Walbury to Gurinji, there were some stories in various rags where the typical headline was, Languages Mixing Together Baffled Scientists. <laughs> That's why we're doing this. So now we're going to move on. There is a language called Yiddish. And something that the rags often tell you is that Yiddish is dying. And the story will always have a photograph of a, of a bookstore that's closing. <laughs> Last time I checked, tens of thousands of child human beings were being raised in Yiddish every day. That is not what I call a dying language. We're now going to hear a talk about Yiddish from Rachel Steindl Burton. And the title is This You Call a Rise Fall. Rachel, it's yours. All right. So one thing linguists know is that learning a new language is really hard if you're not a kid. And one of the things you have to figure out when you're learning a new language is how to make sounds that are not in your native language. So for example, if you're learning Yiddish and you're an English speaker, you need to learn how to make the H sound in words like chutzpah. <laughs> so as hard as sounds like new sounds like that are, sometimes it's even harder to learn a sound that's almost but not quite like one in your native language. So lots of languages, for example, have an uh, O-like sound, but languages will have differences in how exactly they make that sound. So in English, for example, it's more like O, and in other languages, it's more like O. So I study intonation, which is the melody of speech, and that's part of what you need to learn when you're learning a new language. And there are two things you need to learn to figure out. So the first is figuring out what melodies get used for what. So in English, for example, if I want to signal that I'm asking a question, my voice will rise at the end of the sentence. So I'll say something like, you did what? Now, if I want to show that I'm asking that question and I'm surprised, instead of a rise, I'll do a rise, fall, rise. I'll say something like, you did what? Now, these patterns are language specific. So in Yiddish, just like English, you use a rise to signal that you're asking a question. But if I want to show that I'm surprised, instead of doing that rise, fall, rise, it's simply a rise, fall. So to give my best impression, it would be something like height is a tonus, where it goes up and down at the end. And just for fun, here's Mel Brooks imitating that rise, fall in English. You're height of me. <laughs> so that's one thing you need to learn to figure out what melodies get used for what. And the second is sort of like that O thing I was talking about before. Now, English has rise falls just like Yiddish, but based on my research and some other people's observations, the rise falls in Yiddish are much bigger and higher than the rise falls in English. So that's part two of what you need to figure out is how to make those rise falls sound different. So I was looking at three people, they were all older and part of a Yiddish club in Dayton, Ohio, and I wanted to see how well they did at these things, figuring out the melodies of Yiddish and also making sure that their melodies sounded different. So part one, how were they at figuring out the different melodies? Not so good. So they were OK when the melodies were the same as in English, right? They could handle doing a rise for a question. But for the most part, figuring out that they needed to do a rise fall on the incredulous question instead of a rise fall rise, they weren't really good. On the other hand, they were good at figuring out that their rise falls should sound different. So they made their rise falls in Yiddish a lot bigger and a lot higher than their rise falls in English. So here's an example of a guy saying the word over in English and then a word in Yiddish. And you'll hear that the word in Yiddish is a lot higher than the word in English. Over. Left. So why were they able to do this? A lot of past research has suggested that this is actually a really hard problem for second language learners. So to talk about this, I'm first going to talk about the word schmooze. So this is a Yiddish word meaning to chit chat or to make small talk. And as many of you probably guessed, it's a word that also gets used in Jewish English. And researchers think that people use this word in Jewish English to signal their Jewish identity. So you throw in the word schmooze to sort of show to the other person that you're talking to that you're Jewish. So my research says that the rise fall works in the same way as schmooze. So my subjects actually sometimes, when they really wanted to show their Jewish identity, they would produce a rise fall in English that sounded a lot like a Yiddish rise fall. So here's an example of the same guy you heard before. And he's talking about a Jewish topic, in this case, the Passover Seder. And he makes a really big rise fall. 
the important thing of the Seder. So, just like a person who is Jewish who's going to learn Yiddish is going to have no problem learning a word like schmooze, they might use it with a slightly different meaning or in a slightly different way than a native speaker. Um, they're not going to have any trouble if they already use this big rise fall in their English, figuring out how to make the rise fall in Yiddish sound different. So what can we take away from this? So sometimes, if you're in a community like the Jewish English community in the United States, you don't know what you already know when you go to learn a language. It's already there. Thank you. I will not say that. You know, there are many language families in the world. One of them is called Niger Congo. That is most of the languages of Africa, and Africa is big. Some people would say that Niger Congo has been there for 12,000 years. That's too much, but it has a dramatic ring, so I'm going to go with it. <laughs> but there is one group called Bantu, that's Swahili and its hundreds of friends, that has spread down all across the southern part of Africa as if somebody spilled something, only within the last 3,000 years. Why did that happen so quickly? There are various theories as to why. Some people think that it was because of bananas. Other people have looked at the problem more closely. <laughs> and <laughs> one of them is Jeff Good, and he's going to tell us right now. Okay. So as you've just heard, one of the striking features of the linguistic geography of Africa is the enormous spread of the Bantu language group. There are more than 500 Bantu languages, and one in three Africans is a speaker of a Bantu language. The group is believed to have originated in what is today the nigeria Cameroon borderlands, and from there, over the course of three to 4,000 years, it spread and diversified, much like the way Latin spread over Europe and diversified into the Romance language family. <laughs> Now, scholars of African prehistory have long wondered what the causes were of the Bantu expansion, and they've made several suggestions. Bananas is generally actually a real suggestion there. Another recent one, though, <laughs> is climate change. And the idea is that changing patterns of African vegetation created new spaces for Bantu speakers to move into. What hasn't received as much attention are possible linguistic factors behind the expansion, and specifically sociolinguistic factors. That is, were the languages just passively pulled along by moving speakers, or was there something about the sociolinguistic dynamics of early Bantu communities that might have facilitated language spread? Now, obviously today we cannot directly observe what the relationship was between early Bantu societies and the languages that they spoke. But something we can do is look for regions of the contemporary continent whose current sociolinguistic patterns might somehow be reflective of the early Bantu situation. A good candidate for this is Lower Fungo in northwest Cameroon. I've been researching its languages as part of an interdisciplinary team, including many African scholars, for the last number of years. And it has three features which we believe make it suitable as a sort of proxy for understanding what was happening in the early Bantu period. First, it's spoken right in the middle of the region believed to be the Bantu homeland. Second, the languages spoken there are part of the wider Bantu language group. Finally is the incredible language density that we see. In an area of just 10 kilometers north-south by 10 kilometers east-west, we see eight different languages, and the average adult speaks five to six different languages. And this gives us a compact and manageable geographic space in which to observe an enormous range of linguistic interaction. And what we're finding in Lower Fungom is giving us clues as to what might have been the social factors behind the Bantu expansion. One of our most important research results to date has been an improved model of the relationship between language and identity in this part of the world. What we're seeing is that language is not connected to deeply held aspects of identity, like ethnicity or tribe. Rather, languages are most closely linked to the local socio-political unit of the village. And this is simply a group of families that cooperate together under the authority of a chief in order to increase their access to resources. Language is one of the most salient ways of, for an individual to indicate that they belong to one of these groups and can, can lay claim to the resources of those groups. And multilingualism is a kind of insurance policy. The more languages you speak, the wider the range of resources you can gain access to. Now, this is not just a linguist abstraction. We've been observing how this ideology, this idea about language, plays out in real-world interactions. Consider, for instance, this dialogue. It's translated into English here. 
but it originally took place in two languages of Lower Kungom, and it was collected by Rachel Ojong, a PhD student from Cameroon working with us on the project. The two languages here are Bu and Misong. Now the Bu language predominates, and that's because the senior member of this pair is from the village of Bu, and there's a degree of deference to his language choice there. The junior member is from the village of Misong, and you'll see towards the end he shifts his language to the language of his own home village. <coughs> and he does this because he's annoyed. The senior man has been criticizing him for no good reason, and the junior man wants to signal to the senior man he no longer wants to cooperate as part of this dialogue. He does that by shifting his language. The senior man immediately gets the message, and this conversation ends right after this turn. <laughs> now, how does this connect to that larger Bantu picture? Well, what we're seeing in Lower Fungom is a language ideology. That is, an idea about language that connects languages to cooperative groups, and in turn, to access to resources. If there was a similar pattern holding among early Bantu societies, this would mean that any non-Bantu speakers, who those Bantu speakers may have come into contact with, would have had an enormous incentive to learn to speak Bantu languages in order to gain access to Bantu resources. And this might have helped push Bantu languages across these linguistic frontiers and facilitated their spread across the African continent. What's important about this now is it gives us a linguistic factor that we can actually set aside possible non-linguistic factors as we seek to understand one of the world's most significant prehistoric languages, language spreads. Thank you. You know, a lot of you probably learned about the Bantu language spread from Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. And remember how you read that about 20 years ago and you've always wished that there was another book like that? There is now, and it's called Sapiens, and it's by Yuval Harari. Magnificent book. There's a copy up in my hotel room now, unread. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Universal grammar has been getting um, a lot of knocking in the media lately. There are articles that you could read in Scientific American, a certain Tom Wolfe wrote a certain something. <laughs> so a lot has been going on. Universal grammar, however, can defend itself, and it's going to do so now. Many people would say, well, goodness gracious, there couldn't be a universal grammar. Well, why not? Well, because it doesn't seem to have culture in it. Well, however you feel about universal grammar, that's just not true, as Heidi Harley is going to tell us right now with some really, I'll keep going, with some really perky information from a language spoken in a country that is larger than you would think if you look on a map. I always thought Korea was about the size of Delaware. That's not true. Korea is an enormous country, and they speak a language there, which is called Korean. You're doing great, John. Keep talking. Don't hesitate. OK, but now I need the, so I'm good One now, thing. but now I need the, 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 the thingy. One thing that people find fascinating about Korean, yes. other than in an intro class where it's interesting to teach the difference between aspirated and non-aspirated consonants, is its system of honorifics. Of course, you can find that in Japanese, too. But if you're studying Korean, it's better to study such things in Korean. <laughs> No, that's the no one is quite language. sure what the relationship of <laughs> Japanese and Korean is. John, if you're going to talk about Korean, you have to talk about Hangul. <laughs> Hangul. <laughs> Hangul. In the 1400s, it was a writing system that was invented. Nobody is exactly sure what the source is. The person who invented it knew right. that there was, was a writing King system. It was King Sejong. King <laughs> Sejong. But There's no, nobody knows no where he got And the cool symbols. thing about the Korean alphabet, I'm giving a five-minute linguist no, talk impromptu, so we'll see how this goes, um, which is that uh, which is that the Korean alphabet, Hangul, is the only writing system, as far as I know, that explicitly encodes phonetic features Beautiful. in the writing. Um, <laughs> I hear the Koreans in the crowd cheering. Um, I had a Korean roommate once, and so naturally I taught myself the alphabet, because that's what you do when you have a Korean roommate, and you're a linguist. We're good. Um, oh, we're good. Working. Are we working? Not yet. Okay. We'll keep going. Do you know that quote, you, Thank that you so quote about how an idiot, Woo! but a smart man, do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. Heidi Harley, folks. Um, hang on, there's 
one more technical issue here. Let's just check if this Similar grammar to Japanese. <laughs> Okay, I will just stand over here. I am interested in universal grammar. That is what I'm interested in. If I could sort of sneeze in here. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and um, I'm interested in what the toolkit is that we build our languages with. Uh, so let's pop the hood and see. So. Looking at English first, we'll pop the hood of English and see what we can find. Um, there are some features, relations, and uh, structures that are highly relevant to the grammar of English. So English nouns, for example, care a lot about the number of their referent. The form of the noun changes depending on the number of the referent. Um, and not just the nouns. When a noun is the subject of a verb, the verb cares about the number of the referent. And the form of the verb changes accordingly. Trust me, this is not normal. If you speak a language that doesn't do this, when you learn English, it's just bizarre. But anyway, we have a feature. The grammar of English cares about this feature number. It cares about this structure subject. And it cares, it does an operation to relate the two, uh, to relate the verb to the subject. Um, so in the search for universals of uh, language structure, we can then run around to other languages and pop their hoods and find out do they uh, do similar things. So to Korean, uh, as John ably uh, introduced you to this idea, um, <laughs> Korean nouns uh, change their form according to the degree of respect that their referent is held in. So if you have a teacher that you really respect well, you will put Gesa on the end of it. Uh, if you have a teacher you might feel a little differently about, you might not. And what's really cool is that this change in form on the noun is reflected on the verb. You'll see that the verb also has a she tucked in the middle of it there when you've marked the noun for respect. So you might think, aha, uh, we have a good uh, view of the universals, universal tools in action. We have a feature, not the same one, but maybe. We have a feature, respect. We have the same structure, subject. And we see the relationship marked in subject verb agreement. However, all is not, uh, 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 I don't know, all is not universal in universal grammar. <laughs> <laughs> there are structures where you see the special marker on the verb, the respect marker, but it's not agreeing with the subject, at least not obviously. This is a possessive construction, teacher's face. Teacher is the possessor. The respect marker is showing respect for the possessor, not for the subject. This isn't like English. If I say the children's lunch is ready, I don't say the children's lunch are ready, because the, agree, the verb doesn't care about the number of the possessor. So maybe we're not looking at subject verb agreement. When we go to other corners of Korean grammar, however, hope rises again. Um, there's a special thing that can happen to certain possessive constructions in Korean, where here's a possessive construction, sister's face, where you can recode the possessor explicitly as a subject. So the, sub the possessive marker there on the first one can be optionally recoded to be the subject marker. Ah, hope rises again. This only works for certain kinds of possession. Possession that involves, uh, involves your uh, body parts and other very close relationships. Possessors of purses are not legitimate subjects in Korean. So now we have a test. Oh, yeah, see not, right? <laughs> now we have a test. We can look at uh, our uh, sentence where we have an unexpected agreement marker and see if that agreement marker is possible when you're talking not about the possessor of a face, but about the possessor of a purse. And you can't. So if it's the possessor of a purse, now we cannot put that respect marker in there. That's ungrammatical. So what this tells us is that subjecthood matters, that that respect marker on the verb cares about what can be a subject in Korean, and we really are looking at subject-verb agreement. So 
we can build our English sentence with its tensed verb agreeing with its uh, subject. And we can just take these same structures, switch them around a little bit, put all the heads of the phrases on the other side. And the same relationship holds. The verb agrees with its subject. Very respectfully. <laughs> So this is the quote about the Korean writing system, which this talk was not about. <laughs> a wise man can acquaint himself with it before the morning is over. A stupid man can learn it in the space of 10 days. So that was how it was brought in. Anyway, our next talk is on something completely different. One has often wondered how a language might develop from the ground up, ob ovo, as they say. There was a time, it's now becoming 35, 40 years ago, when it was thought that Creole languages might tell us something like that. All of that occasioned just a tiny bit of controversy. And okay. now that the it's dust has happen. settled, it's clear that the languages that have come really from the ground up tend to be sign languages. Nicaraguan sign language is one of them. Marguerite Fox wrote that wonderful book about Bedouin sign language. And now we're going to hear something about a third. This is a brand new sign language in Turkey, a country which is mostly in Asia. And <laughs> what we're going to learn is not only that the language is emerging, that one can get from other places, but how do you develop complexities such as verb classes? So Spanish, ar, er, ear, that sort of thing that's so hard for us from English. Well, sign languages have similar sorts of things as we're going to learn from Rabia Ergen. There are about a dozen village sign languages that have been reported so far in various parts of the world. These languages emerge when there is a high instance of recessive deafness in a small close community and when the deaf individuals create their own language in the absence of an accessible language model. One of them is Central Toro Sign Language that emerged in southern central Turkey. It's mostly used in two tiny neighboring villages, and compared to the deaf population in Turkey, this number indicates proportionately a very high instance of deafness. The deafness in the community is mostly within a single family that has 23 deaf members. Well, you may wonder how we learned about this family and their language. <coughs> well, it wasn't that hard because I'm a member of this family. <laughs> <laughs> One striking fact about my family tree is that my mother's generation produced many deaf members, which is a big enough group to get the language going. I would like to emphasize that CTSL is a language at its infancy, it emerged out of nothing, and the entire village is actually a natural lab setting that gives us the chance to investigate what human brain is capable of doing in the absence of linguistic input. This particular study is a collaborative work with professors Anne Sanghaus, Lila Gleitman, and my advisor, Professor Ray Jackendorf. Previous studies in this line of research show that who is doing what to who in transitive constructions is expressed through several structural cues like word order, but these are unidirectional relations in which one party acts on the other one. Reciprocal and symmetrical actions, on the other hand, involve bidirectional relations and in which, with, with the participation of two, uh, with the identical participation of the two characters. Symmetrical actions differ from the reciprocal actions in that, for example, for handshake to be handshake, it has to be a joint action of the two characters, but for hug to be hug, this is not a necessity. Hug can also be unidirectional. There is so far little evidence on the realization uh, of such semantic complexity on the surface structure of village sign languages. In this study, we test the signers from different age groups in order to understand whether CTSL can structurally handle such semantic complexity in reciprocal and symmetrical actions. In our stimuli set, we had transitive actions like one man punching the other, reciprocal actions like punching each other, and symmetrical actions like handshaking. 
the deaf signers were paired up with a deaf or hearing address. See, the signer watched and described the video clips to an address C, who then, for comprehension check, picked the corresponding picture from an array of three pictures. We analyzed several candidate structural devices, for example, in this transistor response, men one with glasses, men two other men, punch, men one get punched. So the signer is temporarily sequencing punch and get punched, although these two events simultaneously take place in the stimulus. In this reciprocal response, men one punch, men two punch each other, the signer is again temporarily sequencing the actions performed by each party, but in addition to that, he's using one side of his body to represent one of the characters and the other side of his body to represent the other character. But this device is not used in the transfer response. In this symmetrical response, father, son, head shake, this time, the signer is not using temporal sequencing, but she is using body segmentation to mark symmetricality. When we compare these two with each other, we see that they differ from each other in that the transfer response does not use body segmentation. These two differ from each other in that symmetrical response doesn't use uh, temporal sequencing, and these two are clearly in complementary distribution with each other. This is not the uh, case only in a few uh, uh, responses, but the cumulative results also support what I see here. Here we see that uh, temporal sequencing is a tendency for transitive and reciprocal, uh, uh, reciprocal actions, but not for symmetricals. And here we see that body segmentation from the very beginning is a strong tendency for reciprocal and symmetricals, but not for transitives. And the increasing tendencies for the use of these devices across different age groups in both of these graphs show that the use of these devices uh, for these different work classes is becoming more conventionalized over time. To summarize, this study has revealed the roots of linguistic organization for different verb classes and the incremental development of these verb classes across different age groups in a very young village sign language. CTSL is a human heritage. It is still evolving. It's not only an emerging, but also a highly endangered sign language that uh, deserves scientific attention before it becomes extinct. I'd like to thank all of my collaborators for helping me understand sign language research. And I'd like to thank my family for creating the language. <laughs>sign language is ever intriguing. There is, this talk reminds me, a special that was shown on Horizon in Europe that Nova here never picked up. It was about Nicaraguan sign language, where if you can ever find one of the fading video cassettes, there is a 20 years younger me, artfully posed in various trees, where I was basically supposed to just say over and over again, why this language is just like a Creole. I haven't seen it in 20 years. Anyway, that's my personal reminiscence. There is something called African American vernacular English. We're not going to hear about it, but you might think to yourself, if there's an African American vernacular English, might there not be an Asian English? And of course, it seems like a rather fraught concept, but let's face it, if language is based on identity, then maybe there's something in it. And Karina Bauman is going to tell us something about it in a talk that is newly titled, Oh, I'm the Token Asian, the Goat Vowel in an Asian American sorority. Karina, it's all yours. Thank you. All right, so as my title suggests, or pretty much explicitly states, my research took place in an Asian American sorority. Uh, I was not a member, you're curious. Uh, so when you think about why people join a sorority or any type of organization like that, it often has a lot to do with some kind of identity that we want to project to ourselves and to others. So you might want to project the identity of Asian American, or the identity of linguist, or sorority sister. Right now, one of the major ways uh, that any of us do this kind of identity work is through language, and in particular, speech. So your speech is like your social name tag, 
And just like these real name tags, sometimes it reveals things about you even when you don't want it to. Uh, so your gender, your age, and maybe your race or ethnicity, and maybe where you're from. So for example, if you hear someone say coffee, you might make the assumption that they're from New York. What clues you in? It's the vowel, aw, in the word coffee. But fortunately for us, our origins are not our destiny. We can change the way we speak to a certain extent. The way we speak also has a lot to do with where we want to fit in and who we want to sound like. So for example, my dad, uh, his family moved from Long Island in New York to Birmingham, Alabama when he was 12 years old. And as he tells it, he quickly learned to stop saying, get the ball in PE class, and start saying, get the ball, like a proper speaker, very quickly. So what's goat got to do with it? Well, the vowel sound in goat is another one of these sounds that can say a lot about who you are, where you're from. How do vowels do all this? Meet your tongue. <laughs> your tongue is a very useful and versatile part of your body. You can move it up or down in your mouth, front and back, and in doing so, you make different vowel sounds. So when you say a word like geese, your tongue moves towards the front of your mouth. When you say a word like goat, it moves towards the back of your mouth. So we say, linguists, that's we, say <laughs> that geese has a front vowel sound and goat has a back vowel sound. However, uh, in some American English dialects, the tongue position for goat has actually changed and moved a little bit further front, so the goat starts to sound like goat, and home starts to sound like home. So we say that these dialects have fronted goat. <laughs> now this map shows one area of the United States where there is a divide, uh, and it's also where I did my research, in the great state of New Jersey. <laughs> so the blue dots show back goat pronunciations, and the red and orange dots show fronted goat pronunciations. Pardon my non-native accent. <laughs> so you can see that, generally speaking, uh, people in northern Jersey and New York City say goat with a back pronunciation. People in southern Jersey and Philadelphia say goat with a fronted pronunciation. But there's at least one group that's doing something different, and that is the Asian American sorority that I study. <laughs> so the sorority members, in fact, come from both sides of that divide. So you might expect to see the region, the dialect divide in their speech. But what we actually see or hear uh, is that the sorority members' sameness doesn't just isn't confined to their uniforms, their clothing. It, uh, they also tend to sound the same. So on this chart, the left is like the front of your mouth, where the fronted goat resides, and the right is like the back of your mouth where back to go it resides. The purple dots are sorority members, and the red dots are everyone else. And you can see that the sorority members are a lot more like each other than anyone else, and that they are further back. Their goat is further back than the other speakers. Right? So this is really interesting when we look at a few specific individuals. These are sorority members. Some of the backest goat vowels come from sorority members who are from that region where goat is generally fronted. And they are even further back than the non-sorority members who are from the other side of the dialect divide. So they are out-backing the goat, <laughs> back goat dialect speakers. <laughs> so uh, you might be afraid to ask, is it because they're Asian? <laughs> well, here's what happens when we look at the same data, but now Asian American speakers who are not members of the sorority are shown in blue. And in general, on average, yes, Asian Americans have a back or goat vowel, but there's a lot of there's a lot more variation. Surprise, Asian Americans are not a monolithic entity. <laughs> so it's really only when you zoom into this particular group, the sorority, that a coherent picture or sound starts to emerge. So for these young women, a really backed goat is not just saying, I'm from this area or I'm Asian American. It's signaling membership in this particular group. So what I hope you take away from this is that something as simple as a single vowel, like in the word goat, uh, can say a lot about you and may even get you access into a pretty exclusive club. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karina.
you ever had anybody tell you that English doesn't have grammar because you know, we don't have ex tables of conjugational endings that are complicated and we don't assign gender to inanimate objects? People say, oh, well, English doesn't have any grammar. There are all sorts of things that you don't think about. And so, for example, I just bought a green big car. No, <laughs> big green car. Nobody told you. That's just the way it is. So if you have to say big green car, oh, look at the little cute cat. No, cute little cat. You just know. Teddy Roosevelt, once called Benjamin Harrison, the 23rd president, a cold-blooded, narrow-minded, prejudiced, obstinate, timid, old, psalm-singing Indianapolis politician. That is perfectly beautiful. And the adjectives are in a certain order. He just knew to do it. And you know he didn't do a thing about linguistics. Gregory Scontris is going to tell us some things about adjective ordering. Thank you. He's giving part of my talk. Sorry. <laughs> Suppose you encounter this scene, and you want to name one of the objects in it. The small brown cardboard box sounds perfect, but the cardboard brown small box does not. You were never taught that, but the intuition is clear. These are adjective ordering preferences. And they're not just robustly attested in English. Here's a host of other languages where we find exactly the same preferences. These are all pre-nominal languages where adjectives precede the noun. Even more remarkable is that in post-nominal languages, where adjectives follow the noun, we find the same preferences, but in the reverse. So what's at issue is the relative distance of the adjective from the noun that it's modifying. And the glaring question is, why should we find the same preferences everywhere we look for them? There have been two approaches to answering this question. The first assumes that these preferences are hard-coded into the grammar so that a given adjective has a specific projection in which it lives. I call this turtles all the way down. The other approach assumes that these preferences emerge from general properties of cognition. This is the approach we'll focus on. Unfortunately, these psychological approaches stumble when it comes to precisely identifying and measuring those properties that matter. So what my co-authors and I did was distill past proposals into a single intuitive psychological construct that readily operationalizes as a behavioral measure. And that's subjectivity. The subjectivity of the properties that those adjectives name decreases the closer that you get to the noun. So here's what I mean. That box is cardboard. It's probably brown. And whether or not it's small is up for discussion. Small is more subjective than uh, brown or cardboard, so it appears farther away. Now, to test the hypothesis that subjectivity predicts ordering preferences, first we need to measure the preferences. And to do that, we ask participants to indicate their preference for combinations of 26 different adjectives. So they saw trials like the red small chair versus the small red chair, and they told us which sounded better. To validate that preference measure, we went in and we extracted 38,000 naturally occurring examples of multi-adjective strings, and we calculated the average distance of every adjective from the noun. Now, if we compare that corpus distance on the y-axis with the behavioral measure on the x-axis, we see that the two are extremely highly correlated, suggesting that we have a good handle on the preferences. Next, we need to measure subjectivity, and we did that by asking people how, quote, subjective a given adjective was. So to test this hypothesis that subjectivity predicts adjective ordering preferences, we need to compare those preferences with the subjectivity scores. And I do that here. So on the y-axis, I'm plotting the preferences. As values increase, I like adjectives farther away from the noun. The x-axis plots those subjectivity scores, which account for nearly all of the variance in those ordering preferences. Here are our friends, small and brown. <laughs> brown has low subjectivity, so it's preferred closer to the noun. Small has higher subjectivity, so it's preferred farther away. Now, at this point, we've tested this hypothesis many different ways, measuring subjectivity differently, looking at different nouns. We even went into the switchboard corpus of English and looked at every multi-adjective string. So we feel pretty confident concluding that subjectivity indeed predicts ordering preferences. Mm. 
But the question is, why subjectivity? Well, here's what we know about subjectivity. Less subjective content is more useful for effectively communicating about the world. So when you hear brown, the set of things that you imagine is much more precise than when you hear small. So what speakers are doing is consolidating that less subjective, more useful content around the modified noun. And what this means is we have clear evidence of a broad linguistic <laughs> universal, the regularities of adjective order, emerging from a cognitive one. And that gives us an explanation for why the small brown cardboard box sounds much better than the cardboard brown small box, even though I know you want to talk about the cat. <laughs> Thank you, Gregory. Thank you, Gregory. Okay, now we're at another part, and this is where the judging starts, because believe it or not, as quickly as that went by, you have heard eight talks. So open up your phones and start judging, and in the meantime, might we hear something from the judges who might want to make some comments during? Yes. She's passing it out. <laughs> Gretchen Brenner, Michael Ben, have you have you any general commentary or witty remarks? Just that perhaps before the um, judging is final, the uh, people could all stand up and we could take their picture, but so people could see them. Yes. So we don't get a recent seat. Okay. Hi, Gretchen. It's on now. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say there were a lot of really great talks, and I'm going to have a really hard time choosing um, because that sounds like a good t topic to say to this crowd, but also it's true. Um, I think I really like, I really want to give feedback, but I think I should do that after. Hmm. <laughs> I just took this mic because somebody needed to take it, so I don't really know what I'm saying <laughs> right now. Um, but one of the things that I've discovered is if you say words uh, more casually in front of an audience, people laugh. Um, especially when you admit that things are awkward, they laugh a lot more. That is always guaranteed. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I. Yeah. Gretchen, somebody wants to hear more about Korean. <laughs> okay, no, so like Korean is really cool though. <laughs> Come find me. Look it up on Wikipedia. It's all there on Wikipedia. Go look for the Korean alphabet on Wikipedia. I, I send you that link. Hi, Ben Zimmer. Well, hello. Great job, everybody, and I, I really enjoyed it. And, and um, there are certain, certain things that we can say in general that, uh, that are great to see and great to uh, have good explanatory force for people beyond this room. Um, and one of, those, one of those great tricks is metaphors. We had a lot of great metaphors, very often visually interesting metaphors. Chain shifts are like musical chairs. Uh, the uh, you know idea of language as the name tag, for instance, um, and when those work, they really work. Um, and it, it's always great to as a as a kind of a way to translate to an audience that's not used to hearing about chain shifts or language identity and that sort of thing. Uh, that's just a general comment, and I th I'm pretty sure every single. Uh, participant had at least one good metaphor there, and like Gretchen said, that's going to make it uh, difficult to choose because everybody, I think, was keying in on that. There were some more opaque moments there, which again might play well to this room, but uh, not necessarily to people who uh, understand all the nitty gritty. Okay. I can give like that. Okay, thanks. That that was that was good. I can, I can say general things. Um, I think one of the things that really stood out for me was what I didn't realize going into this, but what I came to at the end of it, what I wanted to see from each speaker were, why did you investigate this question? What was your question? Why was it so interesting to you? Why did you do this research? Um, and I think that's something uh, that you hear from on kind of grant applications and you think of it as this, uh, you know, 
like this this thing that like oh yeah i've got to satisfy the reviewer to do this but when i was sitting here following each talk the ones that stood out for me as clearer were the ones that really clearly answered the why question why is this interesting why did i want to find this out and the ones that i got more lost in were the ones that i was still unclear as to uh why why this question was interesting why this question was important and uh you know what it meant about uh about our minds or about language in general any general comments? Judges, I'm about to ask you what your votes were. Are you ready to be asked that? Can we transition <laughs> to that part? It's now time for you to judge. And after a certain amount of time goes by, and that's not going to be much, I'm going to ask you who your preferences were. I'm assuming that the voting from the audience is officially over. And so, Laura, is it at the point? Are they going to huddle? <laughs> Laura, I've heard the word voting and a negator. Something's not happening. <laughs> so, OK. By the way, folks, I didn't introduce myself. I'm John McWhorter. I teach at Columbia University. And very soon, we're going to know who was voted the most effective, although all of them were quite wonderful. I learned so very much. I'm going to carry away quite a bit from tonight, including information about Korean. I thought that, what? For example, this is the first time we've done this, and we are ecstatic to see so many of you here, an SRO crowd. We were afraid only 17 people were going to come. There are many more people here than 17. Thank you for being here. <laughs> OK. And so let's find out who that was. In the number two spot, your clear runner-up um, uh, is Karina. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you can't read my hand. And also, our winner is Jeff Good. Where did he go? <laughs> Jeff, Jeff's Andras. Jeff Good, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it just said Jeff. <laughs> it just said Jeff. Jeff, good, you were very good. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. This has been a wonderful event. And enjoy the rest of the LSA. Thank you. <laughs>